the tragedy that made you into a, a national figure was the Boston Marathon bombing, which is clearly, you know, it's got to be every mayor's nightmare, every mm -hmm. police commissioner's nightmare. Can you walk us through that? Walk us through how, you know, what it, what it felt like when you were there and how you, how you addressed it. And obviously one of the biggest challenges is that not all of the search happened in, in Boston. Right? Mm -hmm. This involved coordination of a lot of different localities and, right. and of course the, the final arrests were not on your ground. We had a very good plan. And you know, leading up to that marathon, we had practiced the potential for terrorist attacks quite a bit. Tabletop exercises, training that we did in the academy, but also um, real full-size exercises that were funded by Homeland Security that brought in brought us all together, had us act out as if there was a Mumbai-style attack. Uh, and we, we identified problems that we had in coordination and, and, and planning and things like that, and we corrected them before the marathon. So on the day of the marathon, I had a, a, an 80-page plan that was put together by all of the agencies, mm -hmm. uh, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, brought all the partners together. And um, we had 850 police officers just in Boston for, for that event. I got a call from my chief of department who told me about the explosion. And he talked about multiple amputations. He talked about uh, needing all the ambulances he could get at the finish line. And so I rushed back here. Um, and because of what he had said, I formed the opinion that it was a terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. So I called Rick Delorier from the, from the uh, FBI as my first call. Even before I called the mayor, I called Delorier, I called Tim Alban from the state police, and I said, we need as many people as you can get, especially explosives people, at Ring Road, at the finish line. But when I got to the finish line, I got out of the car, and I started to walk across the street at the Forum restaurant, and I could feel shrapnel under my feet. Right. And that was when I realized that I've got two powerful explosions. I, c I could see the damage. It went up two or three stories. Mm -hmm. um, I could feel that it was an anti-personnel device. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it happened far enough apart that no one person could have done it. So I felt I had a conspiracy. And at that point in time, I realized it was a terrorist attack. It's a sinking feeling that they got through your, your defenses. Yeah, it must be. Mm -hmm. uh, it's worthwhile emphasizing, though, the incredible response that happened at that moment in terms of, I mean, you would have thought in a normal setting that so many of those people who were wounded would have died. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, they were, the ambulances worked, the, the right. medical professional were assisted by the, by the police yeah. and, and directed. Uh, the, the, the death, death deaths didn't happen because, because the response was so strong on, right. on the ground. Yeah. Um, so you have the sinking feeling, right. and then, but then you've got to soldier through it, right? And you've got, right. to, you've got, to, you've got, to, you've got to take the next steps. So. Right. So I, I, um, I realized in looking at the damage that there would be consequences, but I was reinforced by my plan. I knew that we had done everything we could, and so now there was a sense of urgency in running these guys down. It was really important to find out who did this and get them off the street. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, we started immediately collecting, uh, first securing the scene and clearing mm -hmm. other packages sure. that would potential for other explosives there. And the, the bomb squads did incredibly brave work that day in, mm -hmm. in clearing those packages out. I got to watch them while they did this. It was incredibly dangerous because we expected a third explosion. They, sure. They usually operate in threes. Set up the command post, set up uh, Black Falcon Terminal to process the evidence, and really implored the uh, FBI to take the case. It, it took five or six hours for the bureaucracy in Washington to, to kick in and say, yeah, it is a terrorist case, we're going to take it. But there was some back and forth about that. Um, largely, it was incredibly cooperative. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for instance, in the Watertown incident, uh, when that happened, when we got to Watertown and we were chasing uh, Joe Carr, um, Rick Deloria came into the command post and said, we've had this investigation since Monday, but we're turning the, man, the manhunt back over to you guys because we don't have the personnel here to do what needs to be done in this area. Mm -hmm. So there was, there was a responsibility, transfer of responsibility back and forth that worked flawlessly. It worked really well. Right, right. Do you think there's a meaningful trade-off between privacy or even freedom and protection from, from terrorism? I mean, this is often in the, in the hallowed halls of Harvard, such things are often debated, right, ar around. Um, do you think it's possible to, to deliver the, the freedom, the, the safety people want while still delivering them the privacy and freedom that they also crave? Yes, I, th I think there is. I, I think that it's happening right now, and it's happened over history uh, in peace and in wartime. And, um, 
we just have to deal with what the threat is and manage our privacy consistent with that threat. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think. I, there are some people that would have that equation turned the other way, but being involved in safety uh, my whole life, I, 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 I gravitate towards sure. you know, the, the threat side of it. And private videos played a huge role in, in cracking the case, right? They did. For the first time in history, we went to the public and crowdsourced um, information from people who had mobile devices. Um, and I, I remember talking to uh, one of my detectives uh, when I was leaving. We had a problem with pickpockets. And I said to them, look at all these cameras out here. If, if we have a pickpocket in this crowd, we'll be able to find them just through people's cameras. And they were joking about it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that came back to me as you know, on Wednesday when we went to the, and, and talked to the FBI and everybody agreed that crowdsourcing was a good thing to do. So you got mountains of mountains of, of film or, or yeah, uh, twelve thousand submissions in the first twenty four hours. It crashed all of our computers. It was so <laughs> it was way too effective. The whole world wondered whether or not urban life would change dramatically after nine eleven, whether or not just urban life was so complicated it would always allow terrorists to, to you know, find their way in and do horrible things and consequently we would disperse to lower density, density settings. Um, but that doesn't seem to have happened. Why do you think not? Why do you think cities have been resilient uh, against terrorism? Well, because there are so many benefits to living in a city. Um, you know, diver the diversity that's there, um, the ability to, to meet people and, and to uh, socialize and to walk to venues that are that are very convenient. And uh, uh, you know, there's a there's a big influx of people coming back to cities from my generation and mm -hmm. and, and people a lot younger who are who want to live uh, where there's uh, a lot going on. Um, and so, I, I don't think the terrorists have frightened us uh, to the point where we're changing our. Uh, our habits. Uh, everybody gets on a plane. Everybody uh, goes to a city. Um, the the crowds that come in for the Fourth of July celebrations are a good indicator that will will not be you know frightened into changing our actions and our activities. And cities are great places. They're vital, exciting, fun places to be. That's absolutely right. Thank you, Ed.